So um, I wanted to mention that, you know, to point out that it's about 31 years. It's actually 31 years and eight weeks or so, give or take, that Tim Berners-Lee actually first proposed the wor World Wide Web as an information management system. And he was actually rejected at first, and it was not compelling enough. Um, we've gone from that into what our guests will be speaking about tonight, the spatial web, which is basically a computing en environment that exists in a three-dimensional space. And in many ways, it's growing into a twin reality of, of real and virtual reality. Um, you know, we live in a world of convergence, particularly in cinema, TV. Uh, it's technological as well as content, modes of expression. Convergence assumes that a cross-device user experience is the same or at least similar for everyone. How is that going to change in this world of spatial computing and with our many realities, uh, AR, VR, XR, uh, I'd like to say whatever. Uh, it's be it augmented, virtual, mixed. Uh, we're going through a sea change, and that's why our guests are here tonight to, you know, help us navigate through this sea change as we look upon our world, from, whether from this lockdown or semi-lockdown conditions. All of us have been pushed to the web now, whether we were comfortable with that idea or not. We're translating our experience, our talents, and our creative work and often we'll be doing this in a collaborative environment and learning from it. And with that, I will uh, introduce Zanka, who I first worked with several years ago. We were uh, working with a, a downtown arts organization, hoping to get an artist-run com community center with galleries and shows and projects for emerging artists to go. And uh, we connected on that. Zanka spoke at several of my classes and was very inspiring, and her work is constantly changing, transforming, and I'm going to let her explain where that journey has taken her today. Thank you, Anna Marie. Um, yeah, so tonight we have a really special night planned for everyone. Um, we are going to be talking about how to get to the wisdom age, and we're going to be looking at um, the spatial web, right? Uh, what she was just saying, you know, the internet is going to go way beyond this little screen that we have in front of us. Um, there's going to be digital things that are mixed with our reality, and it's going to change the way we do almost everything. And we're also going to talk about the future of curiosity tonight, because that is the driving force um, that is, is starting to transform the world. They say that the only thing stronger than fear is curiosity itself. And we're going to look at these topics in a very blown out way. I'm going to, I'm going to really zoom out and we're going to look at the big picture and we're going to talk about what we can do now. Um, we're going to have some very special guests with us tonight. Um, Dylan Levitt is going to be talking about transformation. He's going to be talking about VR. He's going to be talking about his dreams to start a totally new type of school that mixes um, a lot of different um, ideas into the education system. And we're also going to be speaking with Mark Sims, who's an entrepreneur. Um, he's been to Harvard. He's had, he's really let his curiosity drive his life in a way that is so um, inspiring and astounding um, from nanotechnology to business to exo studies um, to ballroom dancing and more. So um, I'd like everybody to um, take a moment. We're actually um, going to kind of mark this time um, by, by saying, listen, we're going to spend a minute right now um, kind of checking in um, and using some ancient technology. We're going to talk about a lot of technology right now, but the strange thing about the world is that we're starting to realize a lot of the ancient wisdom is what science is now figuring out. And so it's a very bizarre juxtaposition. And during the COVID with all the stress that's happening in the world, it's going to be worth our while to take 60 seconds here to close our eyes. So I'd like everyone to close your eyes and I'm gonna start a timer. And I want you to just drop your shoulders Shake off your day. Become present to this moment now. 
take a couple deep breaths. I want you to send some love to someone that you think needs it tonight. Could be a friend, a coworker, family member. And now go ahead and send yourself some love for all that you've been through this year, all the changes that you've gone through. Okay, let's open our eyes. So as we know in education today, one of the studies is really showing that when kids are in fight or flight, they can't learn, learn anything. So that's step number one. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about who I am. And in the meantime, I'd also like you guys to go grab a pen and pa paper. Um, we're gonna be using it later in the presentation. So if you don't have one handy, go ahead and grab that. Um, I call myself a plumber. <laughs> I'm a social architect. We're stepping into a massive renaissance in the world right now. And we just need a few final pieces here to really um, accelerate that in the world. And that's my job is to look at the big picture and see what's missing and inspire people to build those tools. When I became a futurist, I started to realize that as a strategist, I was not gonna be able to help the world solve its problems five years from now because we didn't even know what the problems are gonna be five years from now. And so I realized that the only thing I could do with my life was try to build some simple tools that could go on and solve problems that occur um, using um, uh, our wisdom shared across um, the world. Um, just a little bit about my current work so you know um, who, who's going to be presenting is uh, I've been working on measuring the conscious movement in real time to study the trends um, from a scaled out version. And it's quite inspiring to see how things are changing from the Google searches to the people and the social networks that are changing the way we see the world. I'm also working on um, helping to build solutions hubs so people can go in and self-organize. And instead of a Facebook that just lets you post, how can we use social platforms to actually accomplish great and challenging tasks that are before us. And also working on a startup, which we feel is the future of education in small groups of seven. So how can we provide loving, supportive environments that where you can be accountable to your dreams and your biggest desires in your life? So we're gonna start by talking about education. So what are the patterns? What are we seeing? You know, we're moving away from this stage, stage on the stage and into something more decentralized and even distributed. Maybe you guys have heard of some of these crazy terms that are being become popular today. Flipping the classroom is where the teacher will give all the um, lectures ahead of time on a video and then use the classroom time to discuss unschooling takes the takes the curiosity of the students and make, turns that into the lessons. So Sugata is a hero to the world. Um, he, his curiosity, led him to turn around his computer in the slums of Delhi and put a keyboard outside in a computer and just see what would happen. And what happened was astounding. The children who didn't even speak English figured out the character mapping on the keyboard and then started doing DNA replication. And he realized that he was onto something. He won the TED Prize in 2013, won a million dollars, and started a massive um, group of schools around the world with this idea that children don't need adult supervision to learn. Um, they can pool their knowledge um, and fascinating things can happen. The same kind of scenario has, has really influenced schools all over the world. There's um, a school in the slums between Mexico and the US border. And the principal said, we're just gonna try something. And he flipped things around, the teacher gave prompts and the students taught themselves. And they now have 10 students that place them in the 99.9 
69th percentile of the entire country. So the revolution in education is also hitting all of the universities as they scratch their heads and think, how are we going to retool in this sea change, as Anna Marie calls it. Um, so, you know, MIT has been offering their, uh, their courses, you know, out for free. Yale is also realizing that innovation happens when you get a group of people together with diverse skills to tackle problems. And that's what they're doing. The University of Michigan shot up, I think it's rated the third best in the business school in the country right now, because one of their alumni said, you guys, why don't, why don't you have your students learn how to do business and social media with a real product, with real people interacting in the social media? And Stanford is doing a massive project for, called Open Loop University 2025. And they're allowing students to take six years to do their schooling, right? They can take a year off to go travel. They can take a year off to work. They're inviting older um, alumni back. So it's this idea of lifetime learning. And they're also allowing their first year students to take tons of small, really small classes until they figure out where their curiosity takes them. And then they dive in into practical work with um, their professors who, uh, who act as advisors. And Harvard, too, is really experimenting with the whole idea of online education and doing cold calls and things like that. So technology is also mirroring the same trans transition from centralized to decentralized to distributed. And we cannot talk about technology until we, we, we conceptualize, if we can, this idea that we are really on the very slow curve, which is about to be a very steep hill, right? So human history, it took us 200,000 years in the Stone Age and everything's moving much more quickly. We've got the periodic table showing us the same curve. Um, we have 200, um, um, 2.5 million scientific studies being published every year and those studies are causing other studies to be born in other studies. So the next 20 years will be like 300 years of progress. So everybody that's here tonight, we all realize that we are living in the jackpot generation, right? We're getting to watch how we don't have to be the king's son to learn things, to have access to knowledge and things and resources because everything's being demonetized, democratized, used to be <laughs> disrupted, it used to be $15 would get you one CD. Now it gets you all the songs you ever wanted to listen to. So in 2013, this augmented reality headset was 125K and you had to buy a bunch of software, you know, to keep it updated every year. So you can see the same curve of the different headsets that are being um, invented. And this is the prediction for 2024 from Singularity University. There's that curve again, right? So it's as if you don't even notice it, like just like the water in the frog, it's getting hotter and hotter and we don't even notice, but we're, we're entering the, the boiling point, right? So in 10 years, artificial intelligence will reach human level performance, right? So you could essentially have a virtual assistant that could be as intelligent as someone that you could hire, right? Not to mention your toaster is gonna be smart too and know how you like it or who put the toast in, right? And these, these metrics are from Google. So they, they have a handle on, on, on things. So in 25 years, we're going to reach the singularity, right? Where the invention of super intelligence will trigger runaway technological growth resulting in unfathomable changes to human civilization. So <laughs> this is happening. And if we don't have this in mind, how, how do we prepare? You know, there, this is a big shift, right? And, you know, we used to think, oh, every man for himself. And now we're in multi-win, you know, Newtonian physics and quantum physics. It's very different. This isn't just a small leap in our paradigm, it's big. 
an elephant in the room is that this is rapid, it's very extreme, and that regular everyday people are becoming powerful change agents in the world. So our ability to leverage change is the most important skill of our age. And this list, I mean, who even knows why this stuff is on this list? It doesn't matter. Don't let it stress you out. Be optimistic that there's a thousand more solutions to problems that we haven't been able to solve. And we're going to come together and figure this out. So this is not business as usual. This is a renaissance. And it's an all hands on deck, right? There's no more backseat driving, no more sleepwalking, no more autopilot. You have come here with a unique intelligence um, and you are needed. So we really need at this time, we need an architecture and tools to self-organize because all the university professors in the world are not gonna be able to keep up with that list that we just saw. No one is gonna keep up with that list. We just have to trust each other and everyone follow their curiosity and share everything that we're learning. So, you know, this whole search engine thing with just text is so outdated, right? What you want might end up on page five. There's no statistical information about what's working for whom. There's no context around this. We're going to have to start with that um, as, a, as a new tool that we're going to need. We're going to have to rethink search. And maybe I have a list of resources that I love and I share them with Mark. And then we share them with all of CSUN University and see how it works. And maybe we even start to um, work in visual search where things move around in a bookshelf um, based on um, different groups and different ideas. Because the problem is, is that my brain can only think the US is capitalist, Russia is communistic, but that's not the way it is. Computers are here to show us the complexity of the nuances of the ways things can work the best, right? So the US isn't 100% capitalistic, it's got socialism in there and Russia's got capitalism, you know? So what is this perfect ratio? How should it work? You know, this is not the five options we have to, de to treat depression, all you, though you might think that's so, but there's a system lag. You know, how is it that we can't solve why more people are committing suicide than getting killed in wars and national disasters combined? Like, why can't modern medicine help with opiate addiction? We have got to get the collective intelligence of people who walked through those, who survived those things. What was working, right? You know, I have a friend, Danny, who absolutely loves tapping, right? More than years of therapy, right? So it's like, tapping is free and it works. So it's, it's where, where is this search engine that shows us what's working for who, when, and where? If I don't have money for biofeedback, I might try transcendental meditation, right? So citizen science is entering a new revolution. And it used to be that citizen science was like crowdsourcing. It's like a, a famous scientist would have everyone get so, soil samples or check the lizards and recat. No, this is co-researching, right? The, we don't want kids figuring out science we already know. Let's put them on what we don't know. Like, let's investigate the mysteries of the world. You know, my kid did the Emoto experiment, rice experiment. We said, I hate you. I hate you to one bottle of rice and I love you to the other. And one rotted. It's like, how is that? What even happened, right? I tried a spoon bending party and I still can't. I'm still racking my brain on that. You know, so these scientists, Lynn McTaggart, Bruce Lipton, um, Joe Dispenza in the middle, these guys have inspired everyday citizens to, to surpass what we know is true and really look and, to, and have personal experiences with the body that we have to really redefine how we think about the world. 
they say we're going to discover our extra senses. You know, wouldn't it be cool to have like a, a, a shared database? Like, how do you even know if you had this? How do you develop it, right? Maybe the future university looks like this, right? Where we have different rooms of experts that are building different experiences in virtual reality that can help people heal. And virtual reality is getting pretty amazing. You can watch the Seinfeld inside Seinfeld, right? Um, and we pass sort of, sort of the Rubicon of like, no one's gonna wear this lame looking bulky headset to Enreal and Apple coming out with these beautiful, sexy head, head, headsets. And so then, all this other stuff becomes possible, right? You can fix your car, you can have a cattail if you want, right? So all these things are starting to emerge. Um, and that's paired with the, the fact that computers know what they're seeing, right? So computer vision knows that an apple's an apple, right? In education, they say that we remember only 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, and 90% of what we experience. Imagine the revolution we can have when we've got things like uh, the Labster, right? It's a million dollar lab for anybody to walk in and test their theories with machines that work like real machines. And I had to kind of highlight this next part because it's really weird, right? So the screen of the future is a bio-directional wearable right? So <laughs> pretty soon, these devices are going to understand our inner worlds. They're going to read our minds. They're going to understand our nervous system. They're going to be able to relax us, calm us. You know, Vive already does eye tracking, neurables. You can have telekinetic control of the digital world, right? You can just think something and it will lift itself up. The Tesla suit will let you feel things both um, know what you're doing with your body and then also push back when you're, when you're touching something in the virtual world to make you believe that you're actually touching it. And you know, look out Elon Musk because in Australia, Melbourne, they figured out how to put a brain computer interface in the jugular instead of open heart surgery, right? And you can type 20 characters per minute with just thinking the words, right? So, Contacts are coming in 2025, and they're saying by 2030, we're going to have a digital copy of the entire world. So we're starting to see a situation where the inner and outer world, there's a tight feedback loop, right? So technology is mirroring nature. You know, the great stages of all time say your inner world creates your outer world. So this is raising all sorts of questions. But the idea is that right now we can get on this horse of our curiosity, find our purpose in life. And if we have this scaffolding amongst us, then we can share our knowledge together. And if we have the data visualization, the citizen science and a passion-based economy to support us in fulfilling our life's mission, um, then we can have metaverses. Maybe we'll have universal heart care. If most diseases are caused by a broken heart, um, maybe we can solve that, right? Now, I want everyone to take out the paper that you have, and I want to share a new hack that Stephen Kotler has come up with um, called the Passion Recipe. And I want you to write down, I'm going to give you two minutes to write down five things that you're curious about, right? Don't just write, um, I'm curious about VR, right? I'm curious about how VR can make, um, uh, can, can allow me to explore Mars or something like that. So make it specific, okay? So I'm going to give you two minutes now to just stream of conscious write five things that make you curious.
Okay. Okay. So he actually has you write down 25 so you can keep going later this evening. So he says that after you take those things, then you look for patterns. Are there similarities? Are there connections? Are there repeats? Then you take that pattern and you study new ideas 10 minutes a day for a couple weeks, right? Read an article, learn about the history, learn about um, the terminology, right? And that actually helps your brain to start wiring up this like relational curiosity, right? It becomes an addiction. And when you, and then he asks you to join a Facebook group or start talking about things, join a meetup, start talking about how you feel about th these things. And then you list the 15 things about the world that are problems and you apply your passion to solving those. And those turn into incredible businesses or incredible life purposes. So, um, so this is, this is a wonderful way to get into your flow and to find um, something to pull you on in life. And my curiosity, since we know about everything we can see with our two eyes, has been to understand and map the unseen for the world. You know, they say that scientists used to, used to advance one funeral at, the time, at a time, but it's not true anymore, right? So we have this repressed curiosity that's coming out and we're starting to learn about alternative economies and, and currencies and intuition. So we are who we're waiting for. We just need to create the conditions. So, you know, when a teacher teaches a student to be a teacher and that student teaches another student, right? Then we can have something really fantastic. And when we move to a decentralized um, uh, distributed network, we become this interconnected, wise and agile, and you can throw anything at us in humanity and we will know how to solve it because we're, we're networked together and we are sharing our knowledge together. In the 1930s, H.G. Wells wrote The World Brain and it talked about a little bit what Anna Marie was talking about, this idea that we can bring peace on the world um, if we can come together. So the peacock kind of is, is an embodiment of where we're going, right? It's not these individual chickens, it's one body with many eyes and we, we can get there. So you are so critical. Every person that's alive today is so critical to this moment in time and the wisdom age is, is here. So I would love to introduce uh, Dylan Levitt. Um, again, we're so excited to have him. He recently wrote a dissertation about education and he's gonna be sharing his research. And um, I pass it to you, Dylan. Ah, beautiful. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here. All righty, here we are. Thank you, Zanka, first of all, for inviting me to speak to all all of the people here and for that amazing presentation. So much that I learned. Um, and to all the students, faculty, friends, and family, welcome to the future of education. My name is Dylan James, and I'm gonna start off with a quick question. By show of hands, how many of you want to live in a more educated world? I know I do. And if you said yes to that question, then that means we're on the same mission. And in order to get there today, I'm going to talk to you about building an education system that creates leaders instead of workers. So for the structure of the presentation, I'm going to first talk a little bit about past, then a little bit about the present and where now to give the future some more context. So as Anna Marie mentioned, the internet was only invented about 30 years ago. 
And my main premise, the main assertion of my presentation today is that the internet is the most revolutionary technology and invention since the printing press. So let's go back and look at what happened in the world and the impact that the printing press had on society. Now it had a ton of impacts, but the four main effects of the printing press was that it allowed information to be rapidly replicated, accurately recorded, widely disseminated, and more easily accessed. And how the first information distribution networks were born is actually a really interesting story. So in the 1490s, the first printing presses were in Venice. And the printers at the presses, they would make these pamphlets that had news of the world on them. And they would sell these pamphlets to the ship captains in Venice. And then the ship captains would take the pamphlets to the various cities that they were going to. And they would sell the news pamphlets to the local pubs and the local town centers. And the pubs and the town centers would then hire a single reader, because very few people were literate, hire a single reader to read the news of the day to everyone who showed up at the pub in the town center. And that was the first version of social media. Those are the first social media platforms all the way back in 1490. And why that was such an important event and phenomena is that was when checking the news, so to speak, was born. And checking the news over the next 500 years when the internet was invented, checking the news in that way led to checking our emails, which led to checking our Blackberries, which led to checking our phones and being inundated with information constantly. But really it was back in 1490 that information became a valuable public resource, became something that anybody could access and anybody could benefit from in their life by having access to. So again, my main assertion is that the internet is the most revolutionary invention since the printing press. And the reason for that is because up until 30 years ago when the internet was invented, information and knowledge was a scarce resource. We had to go to educational institutions to get the best of the best knowledge and information. If I wanted to be you know, a genetic researcher, I couldn't, I couldn't go anywhere but a university to learn about that. And when the internet was invented over the next 30 years leading up to modern day, now that's changed. Information is now a commodity. I mean, we live in a world where I can learn only thing I wanna know and learn how to perform almost any skill literally within seconds. I can find a YouTube video or a tutorial or a class on Udemy or various other platforms. And so what's happened is information is no longer as, as valuable as it once was and knowledge is no longer as valuable as it once was. And how I learned this was through my own journey, really. I went to Loyola Marymount University. I got a degree in communication studies. And my freshman year of college, I found the world of personal development. I always struggled with women as a young college student. And so I went online to look at how to get a girlfriend. And I found courses on it and I studied them. And that led me to people like Tony Robbins and people like Dean Graziosi and Brendan Burchard and all these people who had courses about how to develop myself and how to become the man that I would be and how to have better social skills and all this really practical knowledge. And when I got to become a senior in 2016, I had this realization, this epiphany that the in is the most revolutionary invention since the printing press. Because as a senior in college, I looked back at all the class that I took in my university education, a lot of communication studies and psychology classes, and they were super valuable. I learned a ton. And then I looked back at all the personal development courses that I went through. And I asked myself, which of those was more valuable for me in actually giving me the skills and the confidence to forge my own path in life? And it wasn't even a question. It was by far the personal development courses that I invested in a self-education, that I invested in 
that gave me the confidence and the direction and the social skills and the practical knowledge I needed to become a coach. And because I was so passionate about self-education and personal development, I went into becoming a relationship coach and I got a job with a company called The Span. And none of that would have been possible without the self-education that I invested in, which is why I'm so passionate about it. So let's fast forward to present day and look at how effective our current education system is as a whole. Not any single university, but the entire educational system and institution. And in the paper that I recently wrote that Zanka mentioned, I pulled out the five most profound and, and biggest facts from it for all of you to just illustrate where we're at, where we're at currently. So fact number one, the average cost of a four-year college has gone up over 800% in the last 30 years. Currently, it's, uh, the average cost of a four-year public college is $35,050, and the average cost of a four-year pub, uh, so that one was public, the average cost of a four-year private college is $54,800, and that includes everything, tuition plus room and board and all that. Number two, only 27% of college graduates work in a field related to their major. And that was from a 2010 study where they surveyed over uh, 36 million college students. Number three, 42% of college students don't graduate within six years. Number four, of those that do graduate, 53% are unemployed or working in a job that does not require a bachelor's degree. And number five, the average cumulative debt balance, which means the average amount of debt that a student graduates with, is $26,900 for four-year public colleges and $32,600 for four-year private colleges. And the average American worker's salary is $44,700, which means that the average student is graduating with an amount of debt that's almost equal to what the average American worker makes in a year. So there's a, a number of conclusions we could draw from all these facts, but the only one I'll draw is that our education system as a whole does not work for many students. Not all, but for many students, it just doesn't work. And so where does this leave many of our hopeful college graduates it I'm here, <laughs> and if you can't read his mouth, what he's saying is, where are all the jobs? <laughs> and I know so many people who have been in this position. And I have such compassion for people who have spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of hard work to earn a degree in something that hasn't actually translated to them making more money or having more success in life. And that, that's not... The, the institution that I, I want. I want an educational institution that sets people up to really be able to pursue a career and more than that, pursue fulfillment and a purpose that really matters to them. And so the reason a lot of people end up in this frustrated position is because there's, there's a very basic promise that the education system, all the, going all the way back to middle school, kind of tells students. And I'm sure all of you probably heard a version of this narrative. It goes like, get good grades so you can get into a good school, so you can get a good, well-paying job, and then you'll finally be successful and have a good life. And I think, can, can I see a show of hands for people who have heard some version of this narrative? Yeah. And this used to be way more true than it is today. 40 years ago, this narrative worked. 40 years ago, those with a college degree, over 80% of them actually got a job in the field that they majored in. But that's not the case anymore. And there's a lot of reasons that. Part of it is that we've diluted the value of a college degree because there are so many. Part of it is that we're educating people for jobs that exist. And so 
what ends up happening for people who buy into this promise, hook, line, and sinker, go into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt to get this prized degree, is up feeling like this. Like, oh my God, that was not a good deal. And like, oh my God, I just feel like I made a deal with the devil and now I'm in hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And I want to be clear, I'm not calling the education system the devil, far from it. You can see how passionate I am about it and the teachers and the professors that are part of it are such saints and they work so hard to give back. And what I'm passionate about is making sure that we don't set people up to live a life where debt looms over like this dark cloud and that we actually give people an education that's useful, that leads to practical skills and the ability to get a, a job and the ability to have successful relationships because relationships really matter in life and they get completely left out of the education system, which is what's baffling to me. Because if you ask anybody who's over the age of 18, if you ask them in order to be successful, is it important to have good, healthy relationships? Almost everybody is going to yes. And if you want to be happy, you need good, healthy relationships. And they're left out. And so I'm curious for all of the students, especially the students in the, in the audience, but everyone, if we could have an education system that taught any of these skill sets, if you could learn and develop any of the following skill sets, which would you most want to learn? A, social skills and relationship building skills. B, business and entrepreneurship skills. C, content creation skills. Or D, personal development skills. So I don't know if they have cued the poll question. Let me hang on a second. Let me see if I have the right one lined up there. It's the same poll question. You got it. Yeah, I think I've got it. Awesome. I got it. I got it. Oh, wonderful. Already, we got about 30, 47 people who have voted. I'll just wait another 30 seconds or so for the results to come in. Oh, so we have 37 out of 47 who voted. Uh, 13 of you said business and entrepreneurship skills. Nine of you said social skills and relationship building skills. Six of you said content creation skills. And nine of you said personal development skills. And notice how all of those are practical skills. They're things that you learn through practice and through application. Which begs the question, what is the purpose of higher education? Is it A, to set students up for success in life? Is it to give students the skills and information they need to enter their chosen career? Is it C, to give students an opportunity to secure higher income job opportunities? Or is it D, to get... Now, I think it can be made, a compelling case could be made for B, C, and D. I think all of those are present in our current higher education system. And I think our higher education system has that purpose, those three purposes baked in. And what fascinates me is I don't think a compelling could be made that as our current higher education system is today, that the purpose is to set students up for success in life. Because what the purpose is, is to set them up to get a good job. But we already saw 50% of college graduates don't have a job or are working in a job that doesn't require a bachelor's degree. So what like 
if we shifted the purpose of higher education to truly set students up for holistic success, not just making a lot of money. Yes, that's very important. However, again, there's so many other areas of life that get left out. I'm gonna to touch on some of those important areas in just a few minutes, but I think it's important to first look at why are we seeing this breakdown? Why are we seeing so many students who are graduating and going into careers that don't require a degree or not graduating? Well, when we look at where the current education system comes from, all the way from kindergarten to university, it's an industrial age system that was built to produce workers. And we still have a lot of remnants of that system. That's why we have bells to signify the end of class, because in factories, bells would signify shifting, uh, shifting workplaces. That's why the desks are aligned in rows, because in factories, the workers were aligned in rows. And there's many other remnants that we still have from this industrial age system. And it worked really well. It, it, the industrial system gave us basic skills like math, critical thinking, reasoning, and the ability to carry out tasks in, in a repeated way. And it worked well up until a point, up until the internet got invented and up until the jobs that were available started shifting massively. And we're trying to educate people for 21st century jobs using an industrial age system. Of course, it's not working as well as it could be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors, Robert, Robert Dean. And it comes from the book Master. And he said, knowledge of history, science, or liter literature is abstract, and the process of learning largely involves passive absorption. This habit of learning is largely unsuited for the practical, self-directed phase of life that comes next. And what he's talking about is that the way that we learn has a lot to do with memorizing information, repeating that information for an exam, and that's not actually conducive to retention. And instead, and, and beyond that, the value of information, as I mentioned earlier, is going way down. We no longer need to go to university to learn most things, to get most knowledge. We no longer need to go to a university to develop most skills. So for the 21st century, what make a university education valuable? What will make it something that you can't get in other places? And what would an institution whose purpose is to create leaders instead of workers actually look like? What would the curriculum be like? How would it be different than it is today? Well, my assertion is that education in the digital, digital age will be about two things mainly. It will be about self-education and it will be about experiential learning. Because self-education, personal development, you can't do that in a vacuum. You can't do that by yourself. You need other people to create a space in a container to learn about yourself. And we need universities to facilitate growth producing experiences. Examples of that are already in universities, studying abroad, doing service missions. These are examples of experiential learning, but they go way beyond that. And self-education, what is self-education? It's a huge subject. There's a $5 billion personal development industry. $5 billion a year gets spent on personal development. So people are craving self-education. They want it more than ever. And what I believe would be effective for an education system to have is for the first two years to be all about self-education. Imagine after Imagine if after two years of college, every student had the answers to these questions. Who am I at my core? What are my core beliefs? What are my essential attributes? What are my unique skills and abilities? What am I great at? 
What do I love doing more than anything else? How do I want to impact other people in the world? What have I been through in life that I can use to solve a major problem? What is my purpose on this planet? And what skills and abilities will give me the best chance to actually achieve this purpose? If we had students abundantly clear on these questions after two years of college, then we could deliver to the next two years of curriculum with the specific skills that they would need to achieve that purpose. We get rid of useless classes where students are bored out of their minds. We get rid of students graduating with degrees that just gather dust. And we have students graduating after two years, we have them with a, a purpose, a plan, and then the next two years can be all about implementation and all about experiential learning. Going back to what Sanka mentioned earlier, like actually doing it, having classes where you're actually doing it. And when we teach people about what about who they are, before we teach them about what they should know, we, we educate students to become leaders instead of workers. And these are nine skills that I believe every student should graduate college with that will never become obsolete. How to think, how to learn, how to listen, how to communicate effectively, how to set and reach personal goals, how to build healthy habits, how to manage your money, how to promote your ideas, and how to have successful relationships. Those skills are core. And every leader, every great leader has those skills. And if that's what we shift towards teaching, the education will never become useless, obsolete, or something that never gets actually put into practice. So experiential learning is a huge category, but I'm just gonna go briefly over it so that you guys have an understanding of, of what it is. I pulled this definition from a textbook that was written on the subject in 2002. The definition they give is experiential learning is an approach that engages the learner using elements of action, reflection, and transfer. We've all done experiential learning. It's how you learn to ride a bike. It's how you learn to drive a car. And if you remember back to your favorite classes from school, the reason you probably remember them is because you had an experience that was memorable and where you learned something. I know I remember my physics class in, in ninth where we built trebuchets. Don't remember a thing about physics, but I remember building trebuchets. And so experiential learning builds skills versus knowledge. It's about what you can do versus what you know. It's about what you've practiced versus what you've memorized. And it's application versus concept. And it takes us from knowing something intellectually to, and grasping it intellectually to actually feeling it and getting it on an internal level. And this is the wave that I see education taking because it's the only thing people won't be able to get elsewhere. So I'm gonna end with a question that I don't have the answer to and I don't think anyone has the answer to, but I think it's worth pondering. I know it's worth pondering. What is the purpose of an educational institution in a world where information is an easily accessed commodity? Thank you all so much for listening and for this opportunity. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, I can't believe you're only 26 years old and you've designed a whole new college system with the curriculum and um, with goals. It's really incredible. And I would have totally signed up for your school. It's just, <laughs> it's just an amazing vision. I can't wait to see it um, come into the world. So our final speaker tonight is going to be Mark Sims. Uh, like I explained before, um, he's been to Harvard Business School, he's developed nanotechnology, he's worked in companies and computer security, he's um, studied ballroom dancing and exotech, and he's really exploring the very far edges of what is known, right? So he's, he's really let his curiosity take him on a magic carpet ride, and we're so excited to have you tonight, Mark.
welcome. Well, thank you. And uh, Lucille, and if you can stop the sharing, then we'll have Mark. <clears throat> there you go. Uh, thank you, um, Zinka and uh, Dylan. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, I too want to go to your school. <laughs> but um, before I begin, I uh, want to first of all just thank everyone who uh, you know makes this possible. Zinka, your presentation was amazing as well, very thought provoking. I learned a few things uh, about the state of technology and where we're at in its application education. Um, I uh, to, to give everyone a little bit of a background about me, um, I come from the IT industry. I have a degree in computer-aided design, and back in the day I got that degree, that was, I was trained formally in computer programming of 3D modeling, uh, how to write programs for automotive and, and uh, aerospace design, and I wrote programs that, in fact, did that. Uh, upon graduation, I worked for Sun Microsystems, uh, a, a, a Silicon Valley computer company that was an up and coming star. Um, they had these engineering workstations that were very inexpensive relative to the other computers that did similar types of applications in engineering and design. And I was hired as a technical support engineer for a sales office in Detroit, where uh, the automotive industry was very strong and a major part of um, the economy there. And so I came on uh, right out of school and landed in this amazing business opportunity uh, to apply my skills and uh, after five years of working at Sun Microsystems, I decided to start my first business, which was called Netrex. Uh, Netrex was a uh, networking company. <clears throat> we were doing a number of things. We were helping, initially, um, helping companies in the Detroit area connect to the internet securely. And back in 1992, 1993, there were no commercial firewall products or other internet security products that you could buy off the shelf. Uh, to help a company securely connect required special custom software that was written in the Department of Defense. It was a program called, um, um, oh shoot, I forget the name of that program. Um, anyway, it was a public domain software program that I happened to learn and I could install it on a computer, a Sun computer, and turn that computer into a firewall. And uh, over a period of a year or two, I became the go-to guy for uh, companies in the Detroit area to contact if they wanted to connect their companies to the internet. And because we, I was in the automotive industry, um, at a time before the internet, uh, CAD files, these large pro, uh, files that were created by computer-aided design programs that stored all the digital information for automotive parts and assemblies, were, took up a lot of space. And um, they were large files that had to be transferred from one building to another facility uh, by car, by vehicle. And there were companies that were given the moniker sneaker net companies uh, to transfer these files quickly because they needed to be moved from one location to another very quickly. And with the internet uh, becoming a commercial platform for the transfer of files initially, uh, that became a very compelling reason for companies to connect. Um, it was a cheaper way to transfer files. It was more quick. Uh, and then by getting an internet connection, you could also have email. So email and file transfer protocol, which was the program as part of the TCP IP suite was what was really um, compelling companies in that day of 1992-93 to connect to the internet. And so uh, I became very, uh, I, I did it myself I initially, and then I started hiring 
students right out of college with computer science degrees, putting them under my wing because they were coming out of school with just the basic uh, skills, IT skills, but they didn't have any idea how to install a computer with a specialized software to make it a firewall and configure it uh, for our clients. And that was something that I had to do. I had to train these students or these new employees that were coming fresh out of college and they were young and they were eager, easy to teach and very excited to be on the ground floor of what they saw was a burgeoning uh, opportunity in the IT field with the internet now coming on. And over the eight years that I had my first company, Netrix, we evolved from uh, doing that kind of thing to becoming a reseller of commercial firewalls when they eventually became available in 1994 and 1995. And then other products like intrusion detection systems, internet scanning systems that would check the security of a corporate network from the outside and provide a assessment of the vulnerabilities of a uh, network that was connected to the internet. And, um, and that uh, led on to other things. And I sold that business into, in ni uh, 1999, retired for a number of years. And then I started my second company, which was a nanotechnology company. Um, my background being computer-aided design, I uh, had read a book while working at Sun called Engines of Creation that told of the coming era of advanced nanotechnology. And it, the book was called Engines of Creation, written by Eric Drexler. And in that book, it talked about what would be one day possible if we could use individual atoms as Legos to connect them in, in atomic detail with atomic precision. We don't yet have that ability, especially back then, we didn't have that ability to manufacture or synthesize atomically precise components that could be put together into what we would call small nanomachines. But it was clear to me after reading the book that it wasn't a question of if this was going to be possible, it was just a matter of when. And I saw uh, a revolutionary type of 3D modeling system that allowed an engineer to design with atomic resolution and that at ever increasing levels of abstraction, coarse grain modeling, for instance, using DNA or uh, proteins as building blocks that have atomic resolution, but they're not drawn or rendered in 3D with every atom uh, but just as a glob that uh, approximates the three-dimensional form of the protein or of the DNA structure or whatever uh, the material is that you would like to model from. And so I hired a team of computational chemists and um, computer scientists that were really smart and we set out to develop a program called NanoEngineer One that have made it possible for doing this. And along the line, after about three years of developing our software, uh, a breakthrough came out in, in um, the uh, magazine or the paper Nature uh, of a revolutionary new way to synthesize large objects with atomic precision out of DNA. And we began a collaboration with Caltech, the research team at Caltech who had published this paper to add support in our 3D modeling system for allowing them to, to, uh, to do this, to uh, you know, model things that could then be actually synthesized. And we, we successfully did this. Um, now, I want to, um, one, one of the reasons I went through the, the background, besides it's a very interesting career, um, this led to something that was unexpected. I being a technologist and really believing in the potential of technology to be used for good, I just went for it. I had the means to start a company to do something that really had no business model behind it, no 
a solid forecast for how we would eventually make money. And so I funded it out of my pocket. I was very fortunate through the sale of my first company to do that. But um, what I was presented with at the time that we began synthesizing the structures we were modeling in our software was the very real situation that we could model uh, synthetic viruses. And in fact, this became such a concern that I, and this is a true story, I got a call from the CIA and met with somebody from the CIA who began to uh, express concerns over uh, the use of this program and um, its potential misuse. And because of that meeting, I made the decision to halt that company, to stop it, and I've put the software on mothballs um, until we could catch up um, with the moral issues that surround and the ethical issues that surround uh, these advanced technologies that can be used for both good and for bad purposes. And whether we should, in fact, allow these products to be developed. So because once they're available, there's, it's a genie out of the bottle. It's a Pandora's box, potentially. And I think this is one um, important, very important um, thing that we're facing in all areas of technology that potentially, yes, it's really wonderful that technology uh, has gotten to a state where it's leveled the playing field and made information and education available to all very cheaply or you know, that trend seems to be continuing. Um, but there is this question that we should be asking ourselves along the way is, are there things that we sh maybe should put the brakes on or otherwise uh, set aside until we can have a discussion about whether that's a good or a bad thing? And, um, and that's, that's a real concern for our world, I believe. And so I'm very, as a technologist, I'm very, very excited about the, the ability, the, 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 the potential for technology to, to be used for good, to solve the world's problems. And, but there's also the fact that technology is indifferent to its use. Uh, and there are those that, could use it for bad, pur bad purposes. And it's, I believe, much easier to use technology for uh, nefarious purposes than, than um, you know, benevolent purposes. And, um, you know, I believe in the human spirit and the general uh, idea that we are all good inside, but we also, you know, with the recent few years, we've seen how uh, divided people are and how, you know, our, our own consciousness, um, you know, comes into play on how things are applied. Um, so anyway, I just, I uh, feel that's a really important uh, thing to consider. Um, and I don't know if I'm kind of going off into left field, but I do think that this is a, a very important aspect of education, that uh, it isn't just about skills, but about morality and ethics. And this is a central key area of education that I believe is missing. And I believe it's intentionally left out of the education process, both in public, lower level education, as well as higher level education. Um, for the most part, unless you're really seeking it. It isn't part of a fundamental foundation of, of educational skills, morals, and ethics. And that's because this has been, you know, primarily relegated to the, um, into the um, ideas surrounding religious beliefs. And that can get very contingent, contentious and, um, and, so the schools have left it out of, uh, of the general discussion. But I think it's more important than ever that that dialogue happen as part of a curriculum that's 
holistic. So with that, um, I would just want to check in with Zinka and uh, make sure that I'm not taking too much time uh, that I'm given here. Um, but um, I guess one thing that Zenka wanted me to share with everyone is that one of my passions is education. And back in 2015, I co-founded and provided funding for an organization called the New Paradigm Institute, which recently became the New Paradigm College. And we uh, have a building in Lucerne, California on Clear Lake in Lake County. And that was to be the genesis of a new kind of education center in which we were really striving to uh, bring this question of morality and ethics as a central part of a holistic education program. And, um, and so if Zinka, you could just share the, um, the video that I've given sure. you. Yeah. All right. Um, here we go. Are you guys hearing it? No, we're not. Um, okay, I, you sorry. May have to... I may, oh, sorry. One sec, guys. Let me, uh, oops. Okay, here we go. Let me share with, um, okay, advanced sharing. Let's see. Share screen. Share with computer sound. Okay, here we go, guys. Can a college Me too. inspire a country? And we think, yeah. We think, yeah. yeah, this place, this college, this county. A lifelong spiritual practitioner who's been involved in uh, peace, advocacy, and interfaith work and more than anything else, uh, uh, achieving and developing the transitional, the transformational new paradigm that we all need in order to live from, a, from the right disposition. Engage actively every day with improving quality of life for all. I had that really, really deep grounding in trying to make the world a better place for all beings. That's all living things. Our dog, our pet, our trees, our animals. You know, everything that's alive, we share something in common with. And they can take what they learn here with hands-on experience. We're gonna put them to work. They're gonna learn how to grow things. They're gonna learn the sciences that, and technologies that will help support uh, sustainability like renewable energy technologies um, and then take that knowledge back home where they're from or wherever they want to establish a career to be community leaders and plant the seeds of knowledge and practice the things that we've taught them here. So that's, okay. um, that's a little teaser we were putting together to um, promote the college and then COVID hit and has really set us back. So we're not able to continue our, our work there. We're just trying to put the place on mothballs and weather the storm until things change. And it's really forced us to rethink uh, the approach uh, to a brick and mortar place for an education center. Um, and what we're talking about here tonight, I think truly is a key part of the future of education where people can access knowledge experientially uh, through virtual reality and, uh, and be taught by some of the greatest teachers in, in various subjects in the world. And that will, that's a very good thing because that can be done from anywhere. 
by anyone. And that I think will help, um, you know, expose us to other people around the world, other cultures um, that we may not otherwise have experienced in a place that's uh, local where we're just going to school. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your tough decisions that you've made in your career and your um, outlooks uh, and wisdom. So I also wanted to thank um, Dylan as well. And Anna Marie, you've put in so much time to pull this whole event together. And um, I just wanted to honor you as a teacher um, and a mentor to me as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> I have really loved watching you do your classes over the years, bringing in incredible speakers and also having the students do all these research projects and presenting. Um, you are always on the cutting edge of what's happening new in technology. And um, we love you for that. Um, Anna Marie is going to field some questions from the audience that you can ask any one of the speakers tonight. So um, thank you, Anna Marie. Oh, and you're on mute, I think. Hold on. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, I think the plan is to field these questions via chat. And I also wondered if you wanted to do any of the other polls while we're here. No, um, we'll, we'll skip those. Just go with the questions. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit while people are thinking about their questions and put that and just bring up this idea of the university and the institution. And as we were talking about that, there was a wonderful photo of a brick and mortar, beautiful building and institution. And yet, in many ways, our institutions are beyond walls. And there's been, even since the late 60s, efforts to have education go, and university education go be, beyond walls internationally. So what if we think about education and the importance of the university community and environment, which is meant ideally to be a learning environment, uh, as a, an institution, as somebody suggested, in the, in the metaverse? in another form. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think that um, we're used to thinking of places as, as places and the internet is not a place. But when we build virtual worlds that are doing more than just letting you run around and shoot stuff, right? Um, those become places too. And as the interaction and eye tracking and the, the reaction, you know, we still haven't gotten it right yet, but we're getting close. Um, and those can be incredible collaboration spaces, right? Where you could even visit some, something that was left behind, right? Of all the questions that we had on a certain subject, right? Um, and people can visit 24 hours a day, you know, it can translate in any language, you know, so there's so many things, um, you know, masterclass has done that too. They've taken like the smartest people in the world and allowed them to be the teachers. And what's missing then just is to have um, the students learning on their own and putting into practice, you know, there's so much we understand right now about the world we understand in our heads. And now it's our chance to walk the talk and that's a messy process. Um, so we need to, to be together in that. Um, and so we're not quite there yet um, with, with these metaverses, you know, but once we have some of the statistics of what's working for people and once we, we really um, can bind people together like we've been doing during COVID on these calls and stuff like that, um, we can, we can start really pioneering the final piece of education that we need to flesh out. Yeah, there's a, two interesting comments here. Someone who uh, brought up an interesting term called a communiversity, which I think is an interesting uh, neologism, I guess. And, uh, you know, because there is there is a wonderful excitement to being in a university on, on campus. I mean, I feel, <laughs> I miss that. I, felt wonderful every time I'd go on to CSUN and see students hanging out in groups, playing music, practicing, really working, collaborating, not 
everything, you know, being rote, you know, memorization. Um, and to, for certain disciplines, is ob uh, obviously Mark should attest to that, given your background in computer science, that there's a certain amount that has to be formal education, and you know, especially in, in the math and sciences, um, but also sometimes in art as well. There's you know, skill sets that ha get developed and critiqued. So where do we find that balance of you know, transferring these skills, this knowledge, this wisdom, and bringing in the experimentation that adds to it? I'll, I'll answer that one. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So in the university that I envisioned, the, the formal education classes would still absolutely be part of the curriculum. Because I agree that the sciences, even philosophy, I think is, is, is really central. And the way I envision it, students can, can learn their formal education classes through virtual reality. So think about master class, except in a virtual reality setting. So mm -hmm. even student would be taking maybe three core or four core classes in a semester. But all those classes would be happening through virtual reality headsets that get to design their classroom environment to look exactly how they wanted it to. And they'd get like, if I'm taking public speaking, I'd be able to take public speaking from Tony Robbins and he's standing right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I can learn all the information that I need to know in that virtual reality setting. And then the classroom environments are strictly for experiential learning. They're strictly for putting that information into practice, going through exercises, getting feedback from professors and other students, building relationships and connections with the other students. And that way you can still get the information and the knowledge because that's super critical from the traditional formal classes. And we can have every time we meet in person would be you're putting stuff into practice. Um, someone here had commented, uh, it's kind of interesting, someone, uh, Scott, who worked in education, works in education at community colleges, co college rather, um, he says, we provide high level arts and tech to students from all walks of life, and he can't wait to see when companies hire based on true knowledge and skills rather than fancy degrees. Although I have to tell you, Scott, I worked over the last couple of years to get a master's degree, <laughs> even at this age, after all these years. And I, I loved the program, but you know, this, you've, there's a love of learning and, and then there's the forced learning. And that difference is really kind of the key, I think, in between these. Um, so yeah, where we're teaching students to be inventors and entrepreneurs, and rather than just workers. Um, there's a balance. The jobs that are out there are very often not the most interesting. In my class today, a group presented on automatic video editing. And so we had a lot of, uh, you know, they showed all the different, pro well, not all, but most of the, you know, highest used programs that are out there, some of which were fully automatic and just basically did it for you so that anybody who had never even touched an editing system at all could suddenly make a, a video with music and narration and others that had different levels of user control and the big question for us then is you know what about that creativity the part of editing that's really just like writing and just like painting that cre creative sense uh, where does that end up in this world of uh, automation and computers in the metaverse especially to this group, this is a cinema TV school, so it's a big question for them. Yeah, um, I was also going to comment, you know, I used to work in a big tech company and when we hired people, it's like if they didn't have a degree, it was just like you just, that was like, it was so overwhelming the amount of people that applied that that was like just like an easy like first thing to throw out. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's important. That's not so much true now because programmers are in such high demand that it's, well, can you do it, you know, kind of thing. But this is a re-education at all levels, you know, because the passionate person is always going to do the job better. Um, with creativity, mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting because um, there's scientists starting to say like, well, our intuition, our inner knowledge um, might be just as important as our book knowledge. And that to me is just so hard to really conceptualize. How could that be? Like 
did Tesla like really know all that stuff or was he meditating and getting it? Like what, what, what is all that, right? So that inner creativity is something that I think Dylan's trying to solve, like your connection with yourself, like your connection with your, I don't know, maybe your gifts, like maybe you get it through your DNA, who knows, you know, maybe you get it from the universal consciousness, who knows, but it's I like, think, yeah, our experiential and, uh, but look at a future with, I think Paul Bronstein, I hope I have your name right, mentioned AR, in particular being a great medium for content and data, VR, you know, and then VR for so the social component, and of course mixing them together, but the examples of what can, a, a book can come alive in another way with if it's augmented. So there's many, we're really at a, a sort of a golden age right now, and, and what I think might be hindering sometimes, someone else mentioned uh, less than supportive bureaucracies. That's in a school, that's in corporations as well as we've experienced. and. Um, we, here we have this wonderful opportunity for democratization of media, and yet the, the, the ones who, the gatekeepers, are still in place and still kind of controlling. So how do you think we'll break free of that? Things are moving quickly. You have to give everybody time um, to understand that it's a scary process for everyone to have so much change go through them. And mm -hmm. the more that the, the administrators and the people can understand mm -hmm. what successes are happening and how your students light up and all that stuff, mm -hmm. that helps them. But it's it's all this change is so it's so rapid. It's very scary in some sense. So we have to really be sympathetic to everybody um, in this process as we reinvent everything. Yes, in fact, that leads into an excellent question that. Uh, came up by from Cedric Hackett. How do we activate? Uh, how to how to activate the student voice from oppressed groups with these innovations? Can they be used to really afford that kind of change? My concern is underrepresented groups not having the access to tap in or lean into these. And in fact, last year at the birthday of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee came out and specifically pointed out how women had been left out of the internet and technological development. Uh, can anyone speak to that a little bit? What's happening? You know, how can we help better representation of, of more individuals and players from different groups? Yeah, I think it's one organization at a time. You know, they it, it used to be this like sociological, cultural programming that women weren't good at math. You know what I mean? And so it was this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So we, you know, and then there's like the coding gals. I mean, the young girls today, like they have no problems with this stuff. I think it's like our, our, the birthing of our new generation is changing that. And I think we're starting to see this, like this idea that, um, you know, we all have a piece of this puzzle and we're not gonna get the puzzle until everyone comes to the table every race, every type of person, every socioeconomic piece has to come in. And I think that the culture is already there for that. We, we're starting to recognize that again. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it will be to our own dis, de, demise if we don't invite everybody to have a seat at the table. And what one idea that I have for that, that I've thought about with, education and how we can how we can make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to be educated is what if an institution put their money where their mouth mouth is such that they said you get to go here for free we're going to give you the best possible education you could get it's going to be as good as any university you could go to and the deal is once you're educated and you're in a career of your choice you will have a percentage of your pay each year that you pay back to us but you get the education for free and we're incent like we're a team now we're incentivized for you to do well because if you don't do well we just spend all this money educating you for nothing and now our incentives are aligned and that is a powerful thing in all relationships mm -hmm. we actually had a comment here uh, a thank you to all of you for 
uh, this evening, and Mark for discussing technology for good, and uh, Susan, Susan Meider brought up, you know, that Jack Kornfeld has often said we are in an age of nuclear giants and ethical infants. Um, you know, and let's see what I can pull out of this. It's a good comment. You guys should look at it. As someone who's joined the global movement of becoming an ethical giants, can any of you talk about technology in helping solve our environmental and life crises? Uh, I just heard that just the engines to keep Bitcoin Bitcoin going rely on coal as the infrastructure of what powers all technology and its impact on the environment, something you can all find in your work. And is there anything anyone finds relevant to share about documentaries like The Social Dilemma? <laughs> I can do that later, but let's answer the environmental question, I think, first, because that is something, as we've all been striving to uh, uh, re reuse items and what is the word I'm looking for when you're not throwing something away? <laughs> to, to um, you know, discard. Yeah, to properly get rid of paper and bottles and things. It's you know. Anyway, we're doing that, but at the same token, how much are we using? What's happening with our technology? Yeah. Uh, Maybe Mark can answer this, but I'll just say okay. that. Don't worry, the geeks are on this, man. They've already discovered new ways to do. Um, the the proof of of the crypto and things like that to build whole systems that don't have to be you know approved by the entire chain and things like that so we're on it um i think is the the more that we can know where we're at you know the more that the everyday person can kind of see what's going on um the more we can jump in and solve these solve these things so um yeah. Yes, the word I was fishing for it was recycle. <laughs> Three people with that. I I actually have multiple you know containers to do that here. Um, it's interesting. One of my student groups did do a uh, you know proposed doing their project on sustainability and recycling. And I said it has to be related to cinema, television, and our topic in the course. So they literally researched and investigated, found out that the Producers Guild has a handbook handbook on having green sensibility in in all productions for networks and studios to start following. So yes, you're saying the geeks are working on that and certainly, you know, and there's consumer older. demand. If we demand it, they will make exactly. this stuff. Like Mark, yes. show us what you have. Yeah. Well I wanna I wanna jump in here and and uh, plug yeah. a new documentary documentary that I am a big part of. I'm a, one of the executive producers for a Netflix documentary called Kiss the Ground, which addresses, I think, one of the biggest challenges in human history, which is climate change. And it takes a radically different approach from traditional approaches to addressing this very serious existential problem. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, again, plug this in, the New Paradigm Institute and the New Paradigm College in Lucerne were really originally formed to uh, address the, the lack of ethics and morality in, um, in our world, in, in education, that, they, that we really need to wake up to the fact that we are having a huge impact on the environment and we have a moral obligation to address this. And, and it's an existential threat. That's how urgent it, it is now become. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody on this call, I hope everybody who's watching has some perspective on how we got here. The, 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 the point though, is that we have to take responsibility. We have to stand up and take action to address the many problems that have got us to this point. And I'd, have to, I'd have to say that, that um, certainly in a lot of university environments, and I've noticed at CSUN there's been a lot of attention paid towards that, towards recycling, towards alternative energies, towards making stations available for plug-in cars, and more so than I've seen in a lot of the corporate uh, the corporate environment that I've work, worked in. And I think there's maybe that and more of an opening because of the emphasis on education, on learning, to do that. It's certainly not all over the place. There's different uh, levels of, a, of effort and achievement at different places. But I'd, I'd, 
I don't know that I totally agree with there being a full lack of ethics in education. So well, I yeah. I definitely agree with you. I just think we could do better. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and when I say education, I'm not talking about higher education as much as I'm talking about K through 12. That, oh yeah. And and I do think that there's uh, progress being made there. In fact. We made a special 45 minute version of Kiss the Ground that's going to be going to 145,000 schools uh, that will be part of uh, required viewing by children, you know, in the, uh, the age groups or the grades, I think four through seven or eight, something like that. Uh, so there, there's certainly you know, uh, Zinka, the, the eternal optimist, I think is absolutely correct that we're going to get there. We have to get there. We have no choice. Um, but we, you know, I, I just um, want to make sure as we talk about higher education and all these uh, as facets of holistic education that we don't forget uh, ethics as a part of that. Absolutely. That's a huge part of it. A um, few things that were mentioned here. Smart Company is a resource I suggest for pleasure reading to keep my students in the game. That's from Cedric. Um, and asked if you suggest other resources as a starting point. Uh, someone else had mentioned Praveen. I'm not, not sure I know what DPOS is. So he, he typed in DPOS. D oh. There it is. Decentralized proof of stake. Sorry. It's where we're all going. Oh, okay. No, no call <laughs> necessary. Am I right? <laughs> See it right now. It was right there. It was right, right following it. Oh, the acronym <laughs> description was right after it. So, yeah, that's kind of an interesting uh, idea. Um, can either any of you speak to that decentralized proof of stake? What are you talking about there? Yeah, so... Um, or Mar maybe Mark can answer better, but basically in regular crypto, you would have to verify the transaction with everybody on the entire chain. So that is a lot of processing power, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas a decentralized proof of space, space, uh, stake allows certain nodes to take that responsibility. So you're still checking multiple sources, so it can't be... Um, so that it can be verified sufficiently, but it doesn't have to be network like wide because you're right. We realized, oh my gosh, we're we're killing the environment. This this was supposed to meant to be, you know, an innovation, and it turns out to be taking us the wrong direction. Hmm. And well, so when Kevin Clark brought up open source education resources, the Academy of Software Foundation. Oh that they're looking for interns to work on diversity projects. So, yeah, that's, those are the kind of things that we need to look towards, um, these organizations that can actually bring young people in. And actually, Kevin could speak himself to making this connection, a pipeline from K through 12 through community college to university and the importance of apprenticeships. He's working very hard on there being actual real-world experience through working with the masters and that's actually what I learned through my time with AFI and most of the models that I uh, followed in programs there and that at American Film Institute where I used to work and uh, and and kind of do my class by bringing in these guest speakers and by having the students do the projects and the research it's learn by doing and study with the masters you can make that magical combination work you know it's that's that's the ideal to me and, and the thing to uh, strive for and try to achieve. Uh, Zanka is looking, are you getting ready to wrap up? Do you have some closing comments? No, just um, just remember that, you know, your your curiosity is, um, is a locomotion engine in your life and it can, you know, Mark is a testament to the fact that his life has changed so much, you know, you don't, you're never just someone, you know, maybe you have a life purpose one year and then two years from now it totally changes and you want to do something else and that's totally great and that's totally Absolutely. okay because you're going to bring all of the, the prior stuff with you. Um, so, 
so yeah, yeah, Mark's living proof that that curiosity is 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 such a driving force, a life force. In, in so yeah. Thank you, Sinka, for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I just uh, I think I'd just like to close by um, saying I am optimistic about the future. I think it's very exciting the prospect of being able to sit at home and put on a, uh, a helmet or you know some special goggles to have a virtual education experience and that um, I think what's going to win the day are not just really good educators in that that can teach in that environment but that can make that entertaining and there's a new term that's become popular um, called edutainment and I really think that we have a responsibility as educators to make it interesting to make it entertaining as well as educational and those that are most effective at that are going to win the day that's why i think uh that's one of the important aspects of the cinema television department at csun and kind of bring up a lot of yeah there's i mean the the rise of the documentary form is actually a new option in the television area that's documentary itself so telling true stories, telling real stories, bringing that together into a form that is engaging, because that's really what entertainment is about. If you're not going to engage people and get them to want to be involved, to want to learn, to want to do things, you know, yeah. that's, that's the top priority, I think. Well, I think we're going to say, and we got a thank you from Cedric, and I want to thank Mark and Dylan and thank you. Did you want to say anything? To yeah, do you, want to have, do you want to close? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll say one brief thing. Relationships are the juice of life. And when people are asked on their deathbed what they regret the most, almost all the time they talk about the relationships and the people that they wish they'd spent more time with. Yeah. If I could leave all of you with one thing, it would be to focus on building strong connected, healthy relationships, because yeah. who, you, who you know will get you a lot further than what you know. It's true, and also to appreciate, appreciate the relationships you have, the people, the friends, your teachers, your peers, other students, because in the blink of an eye, you know, it could be gone for a minute. Take, you know, appreciate what you have while it's there, and keep growing, moving towards a more positive future. I think you know, we're having challenging times now, but I like the feeling and wanted this feeling of, of positive, you know, trying to work through it and not letting, not letting the bastards get you down. <laughs> so that's basically yeah. my, you know, my motto. <laughs> yeah, we're in charge. So we as people yeah. together, we're in charge. So let's yeah. take charge. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you, everyone. I guess if you've got your clapping reactions, I'll put a at least one up there. <laughs> so. Thanks, Thanks again. everyone. Um, we're gonna be, I'm going to be uploading my slides to SlideShare. We're going to be sharing the recording as well with everybody who is registered. Um, so, so, yeah. And I love a lot of the comments that have been there. And there's some new people that I now know, both faculty and other students. And uh, we had a contingency from Silicon Valley that had a lot of technical knowledge that I hope I'll connect with and uh, and pull for more guest speakers for my class. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your evening and a great weekend and next holiday weekend. You know, it, it'll be different than it has been, but it's going to be. It's still a reason to be together and appreciate. Thanks. All right. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank, you, Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you, Sanka. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.